Erica great again. <laughs> Mom, how could you have voted for him, Roseanne? He talked about jobs, Jackie. He said he'd shake things up. We almost lost our house the way things are going. Have you looked at the news? Because now things are worse. Not on the real news. Oh, police! Our country had very little pride. Look back. See what was happening. Our country had very little pride. Even look at Roseanne. I called her yesterday. Look at her ratings. Look at her ratings. I got a call from Mark Burnett. He did The Apprentice. He's a great guy. He said, Donald, I called just to say hello and to tell you. Did you see Roseanne's ratings? I said, Mark, how big were they? They were unbelievable, over 18 million people. And it was about us. They haven't figured it out. The fake news hasn't quite figured it out yet. They have not figured it out. And they haven't figured it out. But they will. And when they do, they'll become much less fake. Joining us now, editor of Commentary Magazine, contributing editor at the Weekly Standard, and columnist at the New York Post, John Paduritz. John writes in the Post that the Roseanne revival is a wake-up call for Hollywood. Also with us, author and NBC News political analyst Anand Girdardis, and the president and CEO of the Messina Group, a former deputy White House chief of staff and campaign manager for President Barack Obama's 2012 re-election campaign, Jim Messina. Good to have you all on board. John Padoritz, let's read from your new column. You write in part this. The premiere episode of the revival of Roseanne featured a working class grandmother saying grace before dinner and concluding with thanks for making America great again. And the show got the highest ratings of any network program in six years. One might also point out that the first Roseanne episode on Tuesday was absolutely sensational. But of course, the people who watched in droves couldn't have known the episode was going to be good. What America might have known about the new Roseanne before tuning in was that it was going to be the very rarest of birds at this cultural moment. A Hollywood product that wasn't going to use Trump as a punchline or use Trump uh, or use a Trump supporter as a comic punching bag. That is for sure, Joe. So um, I think what's most interesting here is to look not at only at the gross ratings, but where the show did spectacularly well. The three top cities, I believe, were Tulsa, Oklahoma, Cincinnati, Ohio, and Pittsburgh. In New York and Los Angeles, it did not crack, according to the New York Times, the top 20. So what we are seeing here is a program that went right at the Trump voter and got the Trump voter. There's been a lot of talk that this show is a way of us uh, reaching out to each other and talking and coming to uh, Concord the way Roseanne and her sister Jackie do on that episode. But I'm not sure mm -hmm. that's the real story here. The real story here is if you serve uh, an underserved cultural population, something that it might like, mm -hmm. there are riches to be reaped. And we're told always that Hollywood responds to the bottom line and to the almighty dollar. And we'll see whether this lesson is learned and whether the networks and the movie studios decide to try to play in to the Trump voter instead of trying to alienate the Trump voter. Well, you know, it, it, but it may be a one-off. It, it's like Mel Gibson, uh, and when when he uh, did his movie, uh, his Easter movie, it did extraordinarily well. Uh, movie studios didn't want to pick it up, and he, he made so much more money than anyone uh, could have expected in The Passion of the Christ. But, you, you know, we, we look at those cities, John, it reminds me of what Johnny Carson, uh, the advice Johnny Carson all, always gave to other late night talk show hosts. He said, you don't win on the coasts, you win in the central right. time zone. It's certainly in this case uh, that happened to, to, to bear out in the ratings you just showed. Right. And, you know, Thomas Edsel had a piece yesterday in The New York Times about the exit polling in 2016 which, according to him, wildly undercounted a, a, a new survey studying the exit polls. 
There was a wild undercounting of the white working class vote <laughs> in the 2016 exit polls. And what that tells me is in part that people are still working off of bad data about what con about the Constitution of the United States electorate and the American people and are making possibly pretty bad decisions about what will speak to them based on bad data. John, isn't there? This is yeah, Donnie, very quickly, I'm sorry. Isn't this, by the way, the number one show is NCIS. Isn't a big part of this news is the demo that watches appointment television. That means when it's actually on the air where ratings count right. are the more red state, lower income, lower education. And yes, when you put that on broadcast television, L3 television, those numbers are always going to be higher. I don't see there's that much news here other than there was a good show and a good revival that hits the audience that actually still watches broadcast television. We can't extrapolate right. broadcast television to that's what the entire $300 million, $300 million population does. I mean, I think that's true, but remember, NCIS, which is a you know cop show and those CBS procedural shows, they're not particularly political, whereas it was clear in the run-up to Roseanne and this fight she had with Jimmy Kimmel on Jimmy Kimmel's show about how he had gone too liberal and she had stayed where she was and all of that. There was a real signal that this show was going to play directly into the themes of the 2016 election. And rather than turning off people, That's, it seemed to have excited mm. a lot of people. Well, and, and also, Jim Messina, it, it has a, it's what uh, my former chief of staff and I always said back in 1994, 1995. He said, could you imagine what would happen if a center right news network actually went on the air? They would own 50% of the population. Uh, it has to do with market share. Right now, uh, there aren't a lot of people in Roseanne's space, the show's space. Certainly, do uh, you think that has a lot to do with uh, the 18 million people that, that watched? Well, look, I, I don't think that, I think we're getting a little excited. I agree uh, with Donnie here. If you look at the cities we just put up on the screen, one of the cities that that show did very well in is the blue uh, place of Chicago. I mean, let's not get out of hand. Uh, Roseanne Hatt is a revival. She has her audience. People were excited about that. That doesn't mean that demographically we're seeing some perfectly narrow casted Republican message here. Roseanne is who Roseanne is. And, you know, we are in an age of microcasting, and she did really well with her demographic. That includes blue states, that includes places like Chicago, but it doesn't mean that suddenly we are sitting here talking about, you know, political genius. I also love how the president wants to take credit for bringing the audience to them. I mean, he's, <laughs> out, he's out there crowing about this. In it's his, amazing. Like, it feels like Stuart Smiley on Saturday Night Live. He's got to <laughs> sit up there and be like, I'm good enough. People like me. This is all about me. I thought that whole thing, sitting in Ohio talking about jobs and instead bragging about Roseanne, uh, ratings was bizarre. Well, Fair and, and think, also, uh, obviously, when we're talking about Roseanne, we also have to talk, Anand, about some of the beliefs that she's tweeted out over the past several years, uh, whether it was about Seth Rich or whether it was about info war conspiracy theories. Uh, there's no doubt she has gone to the extreme uh, of, of the political spectrum. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Roseanne the person. Um, I did enjoy, you know, that, that one episode that may be the only one I'll watch, but I, but I enjoyed it. Um, and I think it raised a, a truth um, and a question. Um, I think the truth that it, that it illustrated is working class white people make claim to be against identity politics, but they actually crave identity politics. They want to be part of it. They want to be seen and witnessed the way women and people of color are demanding representation. Um, and part of what was great about the show, the, the apnea machine, Maxwell House coffee, prescription meds, insurance that doesn't work, uh, football stitch, kitchen towels, there was an effort to kind of pay respect and pay attention to the details of a certain demographic's life. Um, I hope those folks will understand that other people also want to be represented, and that's what those demands in identity politics have been about. I think the question uh, the revival raises is, is it only kind of demagogues like Donald Trump and peddlers of conspiracy theories like Roseanne who can speak to these people? Can there be good, elevated, smart, thoughtful, future-oriented political leaders who can speak to these people, make them feel witnessed, seen, and understood, but actually elevate them and lead them to a better place instead of make them hate people and try to shut down the post-war global order. 
Yeah, I just, I, 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 I got to say I'm with my friends, uh, Brother Messina and Brother uh, Deutsch, and to some extent, Brother Scarborough here on this, and I, I, I just, I, if you think about what lesson does this have for Hollywood uh, or for the television industry, the network audience for not just appointment television, but for network television is a shrinking audience that's increasingly confined to a certain demographic. If you're Hollywood and you're thinking about who do I, how do I reach America, you don't think about network primetime television. You think about streaming services and, and online and, and the way that the, the giant, huge, rising demographic of young people, increasingly racially diverse uh, and politically diverse, it, which is all turning off network television. And yeah, you can find 19 million people who want to watch Roseanne because she's super famous. This is a super famous show, and they make really good television. So you're going to find 19 million people. That's great. All for it. I thought the episode was really good, too. And actually, amazingly, it had my father's couch in the middle of the Roseanne's house, which is a whole story unto itself, <laughs> uh, which is part of the reason why yeah. I loved it. But, but, I, but I just don't think it holds some great lesson for, my God, Hollywood now should start to cater to a shrinking part of the market and a shrinking demographic that watches okay. television in that way. <laughs> but Jim Messina, let's now just bring in, let's, let's shift away from popular culture and shift towards political culture. Yep. Um, you are a man who knows a fair amount about data, and we've discussed something on this show to this morning. I have not had a satisfactory answer yet. Um, Washington's in chaos. The White House is in chaos. Republicans are in a panic. Um, everything seems to be going wrong, and you know, Paul Ryan hasn't even figured out if he's going to run for re-election yet. He's right. so worried about the blue wave. Yep. And yet, for some reason, in the midst of all of this, Donald Trump's approval ratings are going up. How is that? Because he has a very solid base that is unmovable. The only thing, he's a one-play uh, one football team. But it's going up. No, He's it's, moving up from the depth. Like, he's had, well, let's give him credit for this moment. We've seen him at 35. Right. He has had upward movement in a lot of polling in the last right. couple of weeks. I'm just con confused. Given the chaos, given Stormy Daniels, right. given Mueller, given everything, what explains the fact that he has had a market, not huge, but noticeable, upward tick over the last couple of weeks. The economy. You look at this, it's all about the economy. I'm looking at voters who voted for Donald Trump and Barack Obama. We're studying them in the battleground states over the course of the last two years. We have a weekly conversation with them. And they literally move on Donald Trump on how they view the economy doing. So the ups and downs of the stock market doesn't matter to them. They're doing okay, mm -hmm. so he's doing okay. And as long as he's not pissing them off too badly with tweets and the other stuff, they're okay with him. And they're gonna sit there until they think he's not focused on the economy. Yep. And that's and boy, exactly that's what, what I, I heard. That's what I heard that reflected ahead, in Elise. Jackson, Mississippi, among voters who had voted for Obama. Then they voted for Bernie Sanders. And then they ended up voting for Donald Trump. And while they weren't super mm. enthusiastic about him, yep. they felt that the economy was doing well and they could tell a difference in their paychecks because of the tax cut. And I'm, I mean, that's Listen, what I, I hear time and time again when I'm outside of Washington or New York. I hear time and time again, no, I don't like him. His tweets drive me absolutely crazy. But you know what? The regulatory relief that the businesses have gotten, I know people who now have a job because uh, some of the regulations have been lifted. The tax cuts have helped other people. I've gotten more money in my paycheck. That's what I hear time and time again. People may not like Donald Trump, but they feel like his policies are making them uh, better off economically. John, here's a, uh, here's Doris, a go, yeah. let's, John, let's, let's end where we began, and that is with you talking about how extraordinary this was. And actually, uh, I've got to say, 18 million people watching network television? Stop the presses. It's, like right. siren well, this is on where, the top of the <laughs> Drudge Report. That's yeah. big. Okay, so let's... We had this uh, peroration about how, you know, the future of entertainment is streaming services of young people in a more diverse America. And that may be true, but, you know, a real hit on a streaming service gets 3 million people to watch. This is, right. you know, almost, you know, 18 million. It'll be 20 million by the time the week is out with, you know, with uh, delayed ratings and all of that. And the whole point here is that poo-pooing the now uh, in favor of a glorious, uh, demographically liberal future is all well and good. And look where it got Hillary Clinton in 2016. Exactly. Was this idea that if she spoke to the new people, she could avoid and ignore the older people and the current people. And, you know, ABC uh, right. itself claims that it undertook a study of American culture after the November 2016 election 
to see where it was underserving and that this show is a direct outgrowth of that effort. So you can say that it doesn't mean anything. The ABC thinks it means something and it's going to program into this world that it decided to examine. Well, you know, the, exactly. Mika, the problem is, of course, uh, there, there was the new coalition that Hillary Clinton went after, ignored the old coalition. Now, though, we have the, the, the problem is now turned 180 degrees. You have Donald Trump that's looking at the old coalition and offending the new coalition. Neither approach is a winning strategy in no, 2020. But the Democrats definitely, uh, they, they, they forgot about those 18 million people who watched Roseanne. Uh, for sure, and it's a good lesson. John Pedoritz, Jim Messina, thank you both. Anand, stay with us. Up next, it's a role Al Sharpton would be happy to give up. All too often, he's called to the side of families of those killed in shootings, including incidents involving the police. Reverend Sharpton is here with his thoughts on how to stop the trend and what he hopes the White House will do about it. Keep it right here on Morning Joe. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.